Hello everyone, we're just going to give it a few moments for people to join us here today. can see people are joining, so just give us a few more moments and we'll get started. Hello William, thank you for joining. Mandy, lovely to see you all again. My lovely assistant, who you all know a lot better than me, Ellie in the comments. Excellent, we have a goodly amount of people here now, so we will get started in a moment. And if my mouse will obey me, I can scroll down and see that we have Georgia here. Thank you joining, for joining us, Georgia and Nicole. And Nita, welcome, your first time. Criminal ancestors, what an interesting way to join us. Rosie, lovely to see you. Ivy, Alan, always good to see you. Excellent. So let's get started. And I'm going to assume everybody can see the presentation and not me just at the moment. I will, of course, come on live at the end. Hello, Five Family History. How are you? You have an excellent collection of um, criminal records with us on Find My Past. Lovely. So my name is Aoife O'Connor and of course I work for Find My Past. And we are going to speak today about tracing our criminal ancestors. And as you can all guess, I am coming to you from home. And who we're hoping won't join us today are Sally and Oscar pictured here on the screen. If they do, I shall take a moment to mute, usher them out of the room and start again, although I have closed them out of the room for the moment. Hello from Michigan and Florida. Lovely. So I'm a project manager at Find My Past, but I'm also studying for my PhD and my PhD covers the discovery of criminal ancestors by family historians. It's what I'm interested in. And this arose from a project I was working with called the Digital Panopticon and also from my own master's studies, which looked at criminal children in 19th century Ireland. So me and crime go back a long way, notwithstanding, of course, my own family, um, including axe stealers and tax evaders. So let's get started. Lovely. Uh, we will see these photographs in a little while. These are just to set up the mood. Uh, a lot of convicts with their hands, of course, placed on their chest so that we can see if they have any disfigurement on their fingers. So let's dive straight in to finding the records on Find My Past in particular. We offer, of course, a global or cross database search, and this works on common denominators. So it has to be items that are common to nearly everybody in the database, be that their name, or the year of their conviction in this case. So these searches are quite broad. We then offer category and subcategory searches, such as institutions and organizations. And these are more nuanced and speak and search only within institutions and organizations. And then we have our A to Z and otherwise it can be known as a card catalog. And in, within here, you get specific search screens to the specific records of the criminal justice system. And so these are specific, focused and nuanced searches. And for particular data sets, they will search on items that are only in that data set. So for instance, if we have transcribed the victim names or the magistrates names or the police officers names, because of course, crime records don't just give us the criminals, they give us all of these other people as well. And so you can do bespoke search options within those uh, search screens. So, and what can you find? Of course, the records of the criminal justice system are voluminous and they cover a wide variety of record types. Some of the types we have are petty sessions, which we'll get to again in a moment, prison registers, court reports, 
petitions and clemency recommendations, and they're a very important part. Judges reports, photographs, we'll get to that in a moment, and of course, newspapers. Caroline McFarlane, we will see you later on catch up. Lovely. So this is a selection of some of the record sets we have on Find My Past for the criminal justice system. I have picked out just the UK and Ireland ones, but we do have a smattering of items as well for the United States and of course, Australia, where many thousands of people were transported in the 19th century. And as you can see, we have many millions of records, the most being the Ireland Petty Sessions Court Registers, 23 million. And for those of you interested in lower courts in the UK, we'll get to those in a moment. And this is an example of an advanced search screen. So as you can see, in this instance, we also allow you to search on the series. That is the series, um, the number which identifies the records in the National Archives. And that also gives you the opportunity, if it is permitted, to go look at the original materials as well at the National Archive. And as you can see, the records for this particular collection run from 1770 to 1935. Now, a slight caveat around a date as late as 1935. The people involved will, of course, have to have been born before sort of 1914, uh, 1916. And the reason I say that rather than 1920 is that when we sign up for these projects with the likes of the National Archives, depending on when we do them often informs our cutoff date. So it'll be a hundred years before the date that we actually sign on for the project. Sometimes there will be rolling releases, what we call rolling releases. And we can, we've digitized and transcribed some later records but generally speaking, especially for those who are joining us from the US, where I appreciate that um, some of the access is a little bit more generous at 72 years in some cases, we're quite stringent on a 100 year rule here in the UK. So let's have a look at some of these records. Court reports. Now court reports, it should be noted, are often published and they are the ordinary accounts, they are prison chaplains, priests, and pamphlets and newspaper reports. So they are published. So if you imagine a newspaper today, perhaps a slightly sensationalist newspaper reporting on a court report, it may not be 100% accurate. There will be a bias there that is being written about. You can only imagine that if a prison chaplain is writing about a criminal, they're going to have a viewpoint on that criminal that is going to come out in how they write about the events that they are covering. So that's something very important to note. You can see it there, it says a true account of the behavior and confession of the nine criminals who were executed at Tyburn. So reportage on what those people have said and reportage on their behavior will be colored by the person who is writing the report. And that's just something to keep in mind. In fact, all historical documents are to some extent biased. They're not necessarily the absolute true account of what happened. Um, and we will get into that in a few moments. So the judges reports, these are ones that are written by the judge themselves. Now, of course, they're going to have the attitude of the judge imbued in them. But they are original letters and reports from the trial judges themselves. So they're not being published for sale like the previous items. So on cases and criminals in which they call for a commutation of sentence, a shortening of sentence or pardons. And the letters often include details of the family circumstances of the criminals as part of the reasons for clemency. So the grounds for clemency in this case is that the lady is 56 years old and infirm. Her husband is serving in the 4th Battalion of the Royal Artillery as a gunner at the Cape of Good Hope. She has six children, five under the age of 14 years, and the family are now in great distress. She, she has already spent four years in prison. Her eldest child, aged 22, is a private in the 12th Regiment of Foot in the East Indies. Her initial sentence was seven years, transportation, but there is a recommendation that she be pardoned and the document is annotated that she was indeed to be pardoned. And there is so much here in this short document. The fact that she has been imprisoned before is not 
a black mark against her. They are willing to still consider clemency in this instance. She has been convicted and there is a string of paperwork to say that she is guilty and that her, her sentence is a seven years transportation. So you can imagine if you had not found this judge's report or if you had not found a document to say that she had been pardoned, you would assume that she had been transported for seven years and you could spend many fruitless hours looking for a transportation record. It transpires historians have discovered that upwards of 60% of people who were sentenced to transportation never actually arrived at their destination. They were either pardoned, they could have been sent into the army rather than being transported. They may have unfortunately passed away on a hulk, one of the ships that were used as prisons. So there are many reasons why somebody's sentence might not be carried out. There is a sentence, as you know, in the very early 18th century, uh, late 18th century and into the early 19th century, the death sentence was used or at least meant to be used for many, many offences. But in fact, a lot of the time it was commuted, perhaps not to life imprisonment because the prisons weren't set up that way, but they could be transported, they could be sent into the army or something else would happen along the way. But they would record a death sentence against the person because they had to because the crime required the death sentence. And so you get something called death recorded. And death recorded is actually a clue to you that in fact it is quite likely that person or in fact that person was not uh, had the death sentence but went on to be either imprisoned or transported or had some other sentence against them and this is a list of gentlemen who indeed were sentenced to transportation but were in fact sent into the army uh, to serve in places like Canada etc so you know they're still going away from home they're still away from their families it's probably still a sentence as such, but they are not being uh, one executed or two transported to say somewhere like Australia. So let's talk about petty sessions. Petty sessions are the lowest court in the land. For places like Ireland, they act as census substitute because so many millions of people passed through them. They could be held as often as weekly, fortnightly, or depending on the jurisdiction, monthly. They were presided over by a local magistrate. This is not necessarily somebody who was trained in the law. And so they were sometimes held in the local pub. And so it could be a bit loose in terms of justice being meted out. Most of the sentences were fines. And so it was very local. And so the idea of a centralized criminal system didn't always affect what was happening out and about. So, you know, the magistrate might have his own thoughts on what punishment would should be meted out for a particular crime. Although he would, of course, be working on guidance with regard to the law. And you get the name of the complainant, the defendant and the witnesses, um, addresses and, of course, what the crime was committed. And as you can see, a lot of these crimes were things like unjust weights. So uh, having false weights so is that when you look like you're sell selling somebody a pound of flour, it's really only three quarters of a pound drunk in a public place, driving without a lamp, one of my favourites. Driving without a lamp goes from being on a cart, a horse-drawn cart, all the way through to being on a bicycle and then a motor vehicle. So that's one that sort of goes on but is applied to different vehicles. Serving alcohol on the Sabbath, allowing animals to stray, non-payment of a dog licence and refusing to quit a house, which of course could then result in eviction. One thing to note about this period, the 19th century, before there was really a formalised police force, it was really up to you to bring somebody to court. So you had to have quite a bit of energy. You know, you had to you had to prosecute prosecute the case. There's you know there's no lawyers involved. There's no judge. No judge. It's a magistrate. There's no jury. So all the all the energy has to be in the defendant to actually bring the complaint, uh, sorry, the complainant, to bring the defendant to court and gather up witnesses. So for the UK, you will find where petty sessions are by going to the National Archives website, because these have not been digitized. And you will notice that the, the results on the National Archives website don't only list what they hold, 
They also list what is held in other archives. So this is extremely useful. This is a one-stop shop where you can go and go to their discovery catalog and search for an item and you can discover whether it's, it's, if it's held in a archive near you. So that's always very useful. So prison records. These will give you name, age, marital status, occupation, address, and often where born as well as a sort of a comparison, a physical description, including height, weight, eye color, hair color, and complexion, distinguishing marks such as scars, pockmarks, moles, and tattoos. Of course, the offense, the sentence, perhaps the next of kin, and in the very later period, starting in the 1860s, but more so in the 1870s, perhaps a photograph. It rather does depend on the prison, and it rather does depend sometimes on the severity of the crime, or if somebody was a habitual offender, if a photograph was taken, that would feed into that. So here's a prison register from Dublin, and we have John Connolly, aged 14. He's four foot four um, and one eleventh, I think. He has dark hair and a fair complexion. He was born in Palmerstown. He has no trade, uh, but he can read and write. And he stole a rope, larceny of a rope. And he receives one calendar month for that offence. William Don Beloham is age 12. He's four foot seven. And he, it says ditto, so he can read and write and he is a Catholic as well. And he ho he stole the halter um a halter collar for a horse and he receives 14 days for this with regard to children there is often there is a period where they have to spend two weeks in prison before they go to a reformatory so that's another thing if, if somebody ends up in a reformatory for five years it could well be that they were in prison for two weeks before that they are mixed in with the adult population, which causes great concern for the reformers of the day, because they believe, of course, that in mixing with the adult population, they're more likely to go on to have a life of crime. So if we turn, return to our photographs, um, oftentimes these were only used for convicts. Prisoners can be people, include people who are not gone to trial yet. So you are imprisoned before you go to trial, as well as potentially afterwards. So these prisoners are, of course, as I said, showing their hands in a world of manual labor, you know, scars and marks and losing tips of fingers was quite common. So your hands were, you know, real, they showed your character and they showed what you'd gone through. And it's something that you can't really change unless you lose another finger. So the hands are shown and the faces are full on. And again, it's a time when, you know, people weren't changing their outfits very often, they didn't have a huge wardrobe of clothing, they're probably not dyeing their hair. Growing facial hair, yes, but there can tend to be social pressure not to have facial hair or to have facial hair at different times. So people tend to be reasonably consistent, strangely, in their appearance. And here we see, moving on, this is 1903, I believe, and this gentleman here is in profile and um, having a front facing photograph and the details again are being recorded regardless of the fact that there's a photograph available age 29 five foot three medium build fair complexion light brown hair brown eyes no whiskers and as i said he could grow them whiskers being a beard as you can see his mustache is listed separately but it could be that at the time he's unlikely to grow a beard because it's simply not in the fashion and peculiarities are marks, scars and left uh, center and left side of the forehead, nose and right cheek, moles, left cheek and under left ear. And as we will see, the examinations for the prisoners were very intimate and we see details emerging about prisoners that, that as I say, are very detailed. So obviously one of the most ob uh, obvious <laughs> choices for research are newspapers. Now, it is worth keeping in mind that historical newspapers printed details that would not be included in modern newspaper reports. And the details of the event can be quite graphic. And I'm going to show you a slide next that is extremely graphic in the details it describes. There's no pictures, but it is graphic. So incidents such as suicide, which were a crime in the UK until 1961, were reported with full details, such as the name of the person and the circumstances of their death. And I would caution anybody working with clients to be very mindful that uh, 
issues that they may not have discussed with anybody else could easily come out in a newspaper report and could be very shocking. So here we have a suicide in Glasgow, a man named Henry Patterson, 54 years of age, committed suicide in his own house on Rotten Row, Glasgow, on Saturday evening by hanging himself from a rope attached to a nail above the door. So all the details are there in those tiny little sentences and we can pin him down to a house on a street in a town and we know exactly how the poor man died. And nothing is said about the circumstances that brought him to that, simply that he did. So here we have a report on the right hand side of an infanticide. And in this instance, the infant was boiled to a pulp. And so the infant is an offspring of an unmarried woman named Margaret Byrne. Mrs. Kate Byrne, her mother, has been arrested and charged with willful murder of the child. And Margaret Byrne, who's at present in the North Dublin Union Hospital, is also under, under arrest on a like charge. So as I say, the details that would be printed in newspapers, although they can be very interesting and offer huge detail, I think the closer you get to it being your own family or the closer you get to it, particularly in time, it can be quite confronting. And again, just returning to children in prison and court, they will be as infants with their mothers. So there was a special area of most prisons or many prisons where children under the age of two would be kept with their mothers. Of course, they're often breastfeeding, so they're kept with their mothers. Um, and they are only usually either unnamed or annotated beside their mother's name. They will, however, often be in prison registers in their own right from the age of two. Now, that's not to say that a two-year-old is out actually committing this crime. Oftentimes, it's the fact that they were physically with their mother at the time, such as in the cases of vagrancy and begging. And we also see, of course, children right from the ages of three, four, five and six, um, and then certainly after seven, because seven was the age in which children were thought to be responsible for their own actions, in for things like theft and absence from school. And I draw your attention to snowballs and ice slides and rules and laws around things like snowballs and ice slides were created, you know, when you have urbanization. And this particular law was created, I think it was in 1854 in Dublin. So laws get created as a response to social conditions. So although we talk about our ancestors being convicts or criminals, some of them could be better described as law breakers. If you consider something like suicide being against the law right up to 1961, you know, do we really consider that person a criminal for having committed suicide? Do we really consider somebody a criminal for begging or not having a place to live? So they are breaking the law. To some extent, they are criminals in the eyes of their contemporaries. But laws change. Uh, they change a lot. Things that were not illegal 150 years ago, such as the taking of laudanum, you know, are illegal now. So I just want to discuss the value of the records of the criminal justice system by looking at sort of a case study. And this is the Kirks. And if you recall when we only had census records online back in sort of 2009 time, we would look at the census records and we would think this was amazing. We had step back, step back every 10 years and we would find these amazing rich records of our ancestors. And here we have a family and in among them we have John, Charles and Frederick. And then, as I say, in traditional genealogy, we would look at 1891 and 1901 and we think, yeah, the, the boys have grown up, they've moved on. Nothing strange here. There's Charles still working as a bookbinder. And there he is again. The family is reducing in size. Nothing unusual in that. Except we then find the three gentlemen picked out there in court and prison records. And it turns out that they had the, the two younger, the two sons had gone and stolen some items from a gentleman's house, housebreaking and stealing from there a silver soup ladle, a mustard and pepper box and other cartel articles, the property of Robert Gossett, presumably all silver. And the father is brought up on charges of receiving. And that means that he knew the goods had come into his home 
And of course, there's a question mark over whether he would have encouraged the boys to do the stealing or whether he was going to fence the items himself afterwards. It was enough that he knew those items were in his home. And he's sentenced to six calendar months. Frederick is sentenced to five years penal servitude. Um, and where is John? John, there's John Kirk Sr. again. And sorry, Charles is sentenced to five years. And these are all over the newspapers, perhaps because they were respected bookbinders in their community. And the idea that they would be involved in the burglary of somebody else's house is a little bit shocking. And as you can see, they're in the whole packet where they're from and the Bridlington Free Press. And as you can see as well, the story goes from the 20th of February there right out to the 11th of April. And that's something else about newspapers. You need to keep checking over the course of several months as a story grows and develops or indeed just gets reported somewhere else in the country. And then we discover, if we look at other red records, that Frederick is considered a habitual criminal. He had been in the Borstal between 1885 and 1890. These were sort of prisons for young men. And the descriptions include that he has a mole near his right armpit, belly, left shoulder blade and chest and a blue dot on the base of his right thumb and a scar left belly. So he has been stripped naked and examined all over for these distinguishing marks. Charles, also a habitual criminal. He's also been in the Borstal between 1885 and 1889. And so we go back to the census and we look at it afresh because between these decades, between these decades when we thought we had the whole story of this family, in fact, a huge amount has taken place. They have not been sitting quietly at home. They have had quite a disruptive family life with the younger boys being involved in thefts and burglaries. And so that's one thing to consider. Um, this may look cut off, but in fact, the original photograph cut that poor gentleman's head off at the right hand side. That's another thing we have to consider is the breadth of the time that we're potentially looking at here. If we consider how different the law was in the late 17th century, right the way through to the 1920s. And then again, as I say, up to the 1960s, when something like suicide was decriminalized. So when you're looking at an ancestor's law breaking, or criminality, you have to look at it in the context of the time in which they were living. This is a prison cart from the 1920s. So then if we think about life in prison, life in prison was of course very regimented and it did change over the years, but generally speaking, the idea fluctuated between trying to rehabilitate people and reform people to punishing people. And we've all heard of the treadmill and the rock breaking. But there was this thing of trying to rehabilitate and educate people as well throughout sort of the 300 years that I'm mentally thinking of in my head. And this is shows a general plan of the prison. It just speaks about it. There's exercise yards, uh, cold air shafts, governor's rooms, magistrate's rooms, people on hand. There's a surgeon on hand. There's uh, the matron's apartment. And in the early years, you have that mix of men and women in prisons. And then eventually you get the separation of men and women, but the children are still in with the adult population. Then eventually you get reformatories and that sort of thing. So we have separation and we have silence. And this is a picture of a church and there are individual pews for each of the men with um, boards so that when they're sat in a pew, they can see nobody and hear nobody except the preacher at the front of the church. Or this is where they would also be brought for assembly as well. So they are not to speak to one another. This is a picture from the 1920s. And although we have lost the separation, physical separation, as you can see, the church is dotted with policemen, guards, and it's a very regimented way of sitting. The space between the men is very regimented. So it looks like it could be individual chairs rather than bench pews, or if indeed it is bench pews, it, it, there is a, a spacing between each man. There's no rubbing shoulders as it were in this space. And again, these corridors, these single cells. Now the idea of course was separation. 
Now, often this times this wasn't feasible. You did get three, four people in a cell uh, because there was an overcrowding issue. And that's one of the reasons, one of the many reasons that transportation uh, is relied upon to empty out the prisons because the building of prisons is expensive and costly to maintain. And so we have these idealized prisons with these sweeping corridors so that the prison guards can look down and have as much visibility as they can on all of the prisoners. And you have these cells which, as I say, are only supposed to hold one person but often held more. The bed there looks like a hammock and those were a possibility. But for the most part it was food and board, quite literally. The beds were made out of boards. There was a concession made in the 1880s for children to have a thin mattress. As I said, we had the silence system. We had a restricted diet for the first two weeks, sort of a bread and water style diet, although meat was added later. For those first two weeks, a lot of prison sentences were actually only two weeks long. You know, it was quite a rotating system. Two weeks, a month, six months perhaps with hard labour, perhaps with a whipping in there somewhere, particularly for the younger children. And you had religious and literacy teaching after those two weeks. So if you're going to be in prison for several months, you did get uh, some sort of education. And that's an exercise yard, if you can see that there. So as I say, we need to think about context. The context of, um, as we'll get to in a moment, our ancestors' lives and the context of that criminal justice system, which varies greatly over time. It becomes more structured over time, more centralized. There's less, there's, you know, judges and jury and police forces all get created. So do make sure that you look at the date of your ancestors conviction and see what's happening with the criminal justice system at that time. And you'll get information on that on, play, on websites like our own site and also on the Old Bailey Online and indeed the National Archives website. And this is a lovely picture that comes from our most recent uh, photographic collection. And it is gentlemen in Scotland Yard categorising fingerprints. So things that are being done by computers now, being done by hand, being done, being done by human beings. This is an execution in the 1920s. Last execution in the UK was in 1964, I believe it was. Yes, 1964. At uh, one time, of course, executions were public. They then moved behind closed doors. And as I say, do not end until 1964. So again, all that context is super important when you are looking at your ancestors' own crime. And again, context and social conditions. The question you ask yourself really is, is my ancestor a criminal? Are they a victim of circumstance? Is it a bit of both? What's happening in their lives? Criminologists even today look for factors that trigger criminality or trigger turning to crime and things that stop crime. So in other words, what they call desistance. So oftentimes they find, although it doesn't always stick, is that if somebody gets married, they desist. But if they lose that partner, they may relapse into crime. It's called recidivism. So you've got all of these pressures and all of these realities that are in your ancestor's life when we're discussing their criminal uh, career. So obviously we have then again, some sensational crimes and some of those are just interesting to read and you'll get those from the likes of our prison, our police gazettes. And here we have some escapes and the picture on the bottom is of a Hulk. And as you can see, several men marching into a single cell there. So that's the end of the presentation. Let me scroll up and see if I can stop sharing screen. For some reason it's not letting me do that. So let me pop onto the presentation to give us all something to look at. I'll try and find one of the more interesting pictures while I go and have a look at some of the questions. Well, indeed, Ali, as you say, poverty, drink and mental illness are often contributing factors and they were noted as contributing factors at the time. 
Um, you have what is deemed, however, and this comes about in around the 1850s, this idea of a criminal class. And there is a certain section of the population that believe that another section of the population, the criminal class, have been born to criminality, that they are unable to change their ways. And unfortunately, Darwinism is brought into this. And this is idea that you, you can be born criminal. So if you are interested in that idea of a criminal class, you know, do have a look for that in the newspapers or indeed just, just Google it. So you have this idea of the deserving poor and the undeserving poor. And this idea that you have to work if you want to receive charity, uh, which is really unfortunate. It's this idea that you don't deserve any assistance if you're not going to somehow help yourself. Uh, did families, Linda's asking, did families typically go with the convicts when they were sent out to Australia? I wouldn't go so far as to say typically, but it was a possibility and indeed your family could follow you out. So uh, it was definitely a possibility and indeed, you know, some women and children did come out with their husbands or indeed if a woman was convicted some of her children would be sent out with her now if you consider this is the time before formal schooling and the idea would be that most sort of say 12 to 14 year olds would be really making their own way in the world and perhaps having a job it does tend to be the younger children that um that get sent out with the mother but it is a possibility but yeah the percentages i wouldn't be absolutely clear on so somebody was just saying that, you know, um, spent time in prison for family desertion. Absolutely. And we have a newspaper called the Poor Law Unions Gazette. And the entire newspaper, it seems to me, is small ads for people who have deserted their family and one shilling rewards for their return to the family. Now, what happened to them afterwards, I don't know. But the idea being that the family became chargeable to the parish and that did not sit well with the parish grandees. They needed that person, be it male or female, to come back and take care of their family and support them financially or to at least bring them back to their home parish and not have um, the parish that, you know, they were being found in and had deserted from being responsible for their upkeep. Debtors, Ruth, um, speaking there about great grandfather who was in debtor prison in Wakefield in 1836 made famous of course debtor's prison by Charles Dickens and yes I could not can never wrap my head around it how are you supposed to pay your debts from prison now some of these prisons were quite open you know family could visit and that sort of thing and of course at a time before social welfare if a family got into debt they were almost invariably made destitute. There is no way to make money. You must make money through work. You're not going to receive any sort of welfare payments to keep you uh, viable and, and to keep you in food so that maybe you can get to your next job. It's, it's a very precarious existence. Ah, unpaid dog licenses, Judy, yes. Uh, the dog license introduced in order to uh, prevent the spread of rabies actually uh, licensed dogs you license dogs in order to prevent the spread of disease and rabies as we know is a horrific disease and it succeeded i believe in ireland hmm, i can't remember the year but very quickly well within a generation of introducing the dog license uh, rabies was eradicated in ireland the dog license at the time i think was two and six two shillings and sixpence and uh, yeah, it's funny what we will sign up to, registering our dogs, but there was a very real reason to introduce it uh, back in the day. It was, as I say, to eradicate rabies. Uh, <laughs> Kim, interesting. I always try to find the positives in the past of my ancestor. Fourth great granny adding arsenic to a cake now gets me out of baking. So you think your disposition <laughs> to place arsenic in cakes might be genetic? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, families are, are funny things and um, we can find out a lot about our families now that weren't available to us before. So it's one of those things that you can speculatively search. You can just pop in your ancestor's name into uh, Find My Past and see what comes up, be it in newspapers or be it in the criminal records. Um, and in newspapers, you can find anything from their prize winning um, dahlias to the fact that they were imprisoned or something like that. But yeah. Um, just going to check in with Ellie to see 
where we're at. As I say, unfortunately, I can't seem to stop sharing screen has now um, grayed itself out. So we shall struggle on. Uh, let me see. Lovely. Let me just roll down through some of the comments here. My great grandmother's brothers were wealthy and respected farmers, except on Friday night when they would drink and drive the farm cart like a chariot around the village and fight anyone and terrorize the policeman. Lovely. <laughs> Excellent, Pat. Love it. Yeah, I mean, you know, some of the offences that we see, particularly in the petty session records, are almost laughably minor. But as I say, this is neighbour bringing neighbour to court. Okay, so this is like petty squabbles being brought up to the local magistrate, the local landowner, the local grandee to say, he did this to me and the next week you'll see it in reverse. The, the other group is bringing the other group back to uh, court for something completely different. And I mean, you do see those cases where people are knocking each other on the head with frying pans. And that's all very amusing to us if it's not our family and we don't still live in the same area. And if the families don't live in that still small rural town, so that's one of the really interesting dynamics is crime can seem, it is very interesting. I mean, the, as we can see, the sorts of details that you can get from the records of the criminal justice system are just incredible. We simply don't get them for our other types of ancestors. We don't get their hair colour, their eye colour, their height, their weight, and potentially, as I say, those photographs. And on the subject of photographs, as I say, they can come into some convict prisons in the 1860s, but photography itself at the time, as I think you'll all know, was quite an unwieldy process. So it's really not until cameras become a bit cheaper, a bit more portable, that you begin to see a lot of prisons implementing this and that's sort of in the 1870s. The other thing to say is that with all historical records it requires them to survive. Now I have personal experience of knowing that documents from particular repositories in Ireland were dumped into skips on bank holiday weekends. So we have to think about the fact that uh, historical records were not always treated with the same fascination um, as we hold them in today. They were just big books that had been left over and let's get rid of them, you know. Um, but now, of course, we'd be appalled because the value of these things, as I say, because they can't tell us so much about our rich history. So checking in now for a few other. So William is just saying that he thinks that connections played a role in his ancestors, the leniency with which his ancestor was treated. And certainly you do see that. Um, I mean, your, your case is quite late there, William, but certainly in the 18th century, one of the first mentions of my own hometown is actually in a Scottish newspaper, and I'm from uh, a suburb west of Dublin. Um, so the earliest mention is in 1739, and it was a young baronet who murdered um, a young worker from a, a local pub. Now, the death sentence was, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, handed down. However, of course, it was commuted and he ended up not being charged with that. So you do see rank playing a part oftentimes. You do sometimes see ethnicity play a part. Um, one thing I've not found very well covered, actually, and maybe some of our American friends can tell us, is, as you know, uh, there is a great celebration around convict ancestry in Australia. What we don't see a lot of is people talking about um, convict ancestry or indentured servitude in the sort of 17th century going into the United States. Not a huge amount written about that that we can see um, or that I've been able to find on that. So that's one thing that I'm really interested in that. Sylvia has uh, linked to the Digital Panopticon website. Thank you so much, Sylvia. So what the Digital Panopticon does is that aggregates sources from many different places. So it takes the Old Bailey online, of which we have a, a copy as well on Find My Past, and it, it goes out from the Old Bailey online and looks to see what happened to those people afterwards, after they were transported to Australia. And it compares the sentencing that they received to what the outcome was, it compares the people who were imprisoned in the UK and the lifestyle that they went on to have and the lifestyle that the people who were transported went on to have. Does transportation give you a better life? Which is one of the stories that builds up around um, 
transportation. So lovely. Do we have any other questions there? Transportation. Now, let me, Karen. I'm trying to prove a link between my ancestor and her father, wondering if there have been relief payments to his wife. I don't believe there would have been relief payments by the government to the wife. Um, as I said, there are cases where wives are assisted in going out to Australia, but it is unlikely that the government would have paid any relief to those left behind. And it was considered, I believe, that in Australia, if you were in Australia for seven years, that you considered your spouse back home to be deceased and you took a new wife in Australia. And these those sorts of things would not necessarily have been recorded in paperwork. And what I mean by those things is, of course, a new marriage would have had paperwork, but the acknowledgement of a previous wife might not be contained within that paperwork or likely would not have been, been uh, contained within that paperwork. So your yeah, transportation is... Many of the county records, sorry, Susan is just asking about uh, court records for Ireland. Now, unfortunately, many of those were destroyed in 1922. Ali Murray letting us know that in the police holding cells in Kirkcaldy and Fife, uh, they were on three floors and every Sunday an enthusiastic religion organist would bang out loud tunes to those who were probably sleeping off the night before. Repent. Charming. Lovely. <laughs> Yes, you have to uh, lovely, enthusiastic organ player. Even at the best of times, that would hurt the head. So centralised prison records. Steve's asking about, are there any centralised prison records covering England in recent times? I'm trying to find, to trace a deceased relative who may have been in prison during the um, 60s and 70s and have tried searching newspaper reports without success so far. So unfortunately, Steve, most of those records will still be under lock and key, uh, not available to consult in many cases and not available certainly online due to data protection issues. So they won't be available. The best you can hope for is actually tracing down the local newspapers, although I appreciate you probably have looked at newspapers. Um, but if you have only looked at them online, I would encourage you to go to what would be the local library or trace down what the, the local newspapers is. R newspapers will come online more and more, but they have to have the permission of the publisher. So it's a case of copyright um, and we can't just have all of the... Um, the newspapers online much as we would love to. Hello from Tasmania. Hello Diane. Lovely of you to join. Would photos have been used for just an arrest if the prisoner was found not guilty around 1844? 1844 we, we, we literally don't have photography. Daguerreotypes and ambrotypes actually start to be invented around the 1840s um, and so there would have been no photography and generally in prisons you don't see regular photography until the mid 1860s and then as I say with more regularity in the 1870s. Hello Maureen from Glasgow. Lovely. Yeah, Jen has made some helpful comments in the comment section saying there are limited resources for indentured servitude in the US and very few records exist, mostly transcripts for specific colonies and most of the big picture academic li li uh, literature is mixed in with colonial histories. So perhaps not down to the individual level. So I am probably going to be thwarted there. Criminal and court records are useful if you have tra traveling or fairground ancestors. Very good point, Cindy. Uh, they do tend to avoid the census. Um, unfortunately, they're often named as, you know, troop in a field or unnamed man or whatever when the census comes knocking. Uh, census recorders were, of course, uh, encouraged to try and track everybody, but they would track them by numbers. Um, and that's the other thing to say, of course, in census records, a lot of the prison records are going to be initial only. Uh, a lot of this was done to preserve the anonymity of the people within, say, an asylum or a prison record. And we have to remember the reason why a census was taken. It was to record statistics, not individuals. So there is no slight to being recorded um, as an initial only. It was in fact done to protect people's privacy. 
Um, Maureen O'Neill is asking about the photographs of her gran if she'd been if she had a record 1907 to 1923 Belfast it really depends as I said on how habitual or serious a criminal she would have been considered by the court or police because or indeed the prison because the idea of course of the photograph is to prevent re-offence or to be able to pick her out as a likely suspect for an offence that may have been committed so it would be a case of and I would check with the public records office of Northern Ireland to see what records are held for prisons in the area so that's PRONI P-R-O-N-I and you'll find those very easily on the web lovely Transportation of Scottish criminals to America during the 18th century. Thank you so much, Emma. I will take a look. Lovely. Well, we might leave it there. I'll check in with Ellie to see if that's okay. Excellent. Um, lovely. We shall leave it there. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Please, if you want to continue to comment, do. Um, and I'll try and get back to those over the next couple of days. And if you uh, want to reach out at all, do let us know. And Ali, yes, the Fife FHS calendar of convicts is an index of crimes in Fife, including family histories and newspaper articles and available on FMP and a wonderful resource it is. Thank you so much, Ali. OK, uh, very sorry I couldn't see you. It turns out you can't stop screen sharing once you start. So that's unfortunate. I put on the makeup for nothing. I will speak to you all again soon, hopefully. And uh, sure, maybe we'll see each other in person one of these days when we can all get back to events. Talk to you soon. Bye bye.